this is going to be available on the MAPC YouTube page and the link to the recording will be shared with you in a follow-up email. So um, don't worry about that. And then to ensure a smooth and focused session, everyone will be muted throughout the presentation to avoid disruptions. And if any participant becomes disruptive during the event, they will be immediately removed from the webinar and will be able to rejoin. Additionally, in the unlikely event of a Zoom bombing incident, the meeting will be terminated to promptly to protect our discussion. Now, as we begin, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to rename yourself, um, to include your first and last name, and if possible, the town or organization you're representing. And to do this, just click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, and locate your name in the participants list and click more and select rename, and you can see it on your screen there. And to engage with us uh, during the session, um, you can use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. And feel free to put your questions into the Q&A at any point during the talk. And we'll do our best to address as many as possible. And just understanding that we may not have time to answer all of the questions during the se Q&A session at the end. Um, and I would also like to show you how to change your view settings so that the speaker or speaker is spotlighted. So it's up at that top in the orange box. Um, and this way you can have a better view of the content and you can do this by clicking on the view option in the top right corner and selecting speaker view from the drop down menu. And during the presentation, a video will be played. Um, and so for the best viewing experience on your Zoom, we're going to make sure that everyone's computer settings are optimized for the best video playback. So you're going to start by locating the video icon in Zoom and click on the upward arrow next to it. You can see there on the red thing. Um, a new window should, um, and from the drop down menu, select video settings. And a new window should open up. It'll look like this. And within the window, click on the advanced button which is there. And in the subsequent screen, make sure to check all the boxes to optimize your video playback. Um, and if anyone experiences any technical issue during our session, please don't hesitate to reach out to our tech support staff, Abby, just like I did at the beginning of this, because uh, Abby is here to assist you and to ensure a smooth experience for everyone. Um, and before we move forward, I'd like to take a moment to give a bit of a background on our Rooted in Nature series. So spanning five thematic sessions, we have gathered experts from the Indigenous communities right here in Massachusetts to offer an exploration of Indigenous perspectives on climate resilience and sustainability. The series supports the implementation of Metro Common 2050, our regional land use plan, particularly our strategies to advance climate mitigation and resiliency and inclusive growth and development. It also aligns with the broader shift in the climate resiliency landscape, recognizing and uplifting indigenous knowledge as a vital resource. An example of this shift is the recent formation of the Center for Braiding Indigenous Knowledge and Science at UMass Amherst, led by, led by Dr. Sonia Adelaide. The series by MAPC mirrors this progressive approach aiming to enhance climate adaptation strategies by fostering a deeper understanding of the indigenous cultures and encouraging collaborations for cross municipality projects that are geared to address the impacts of climate change collectively. Um, and now I'm gonna stop share and turn this over to um, Leah Robbins, who will share a quick message about how the series and today's topic fit into the broader work at MAPC. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so, my name is Leah Robbins, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs here at MAPC. As a government affairs team, we are so committed to getting to work with the cities and towns of the region to lift up opportunities um, to, to both work to, to do this work, but also to, to do learning together. And I really just wanna emphasize um, how exciting it is to be able to learn from indigenous people in the Commonwealth about practices um, that are working well, that we can replicate, that maybe need some legislation to, to get done or maybe need action at the local level. Um, at MEPC, we're really committed to both doing this learning ourselves um, and also to share these opportunities to learn together 
with um, folks in our region and beyond. So I'm um, just really excited to have a chance um, to take a minute, to, to take a beat, um, to, to think differently about how I do my work um, in the region and uh, to, to think also about what this might mean um, for our work as a government affairs team. So um, really this connects deeply with what Metro Common means to the government affairs team in terms of our implementation of policy priorities. I mean, setting our goals and then doing the research to see, okay, what is this really gonna look like on the ground and how can we help implement? So thank you so much, Lindsay, for this opportunity to be here today. And um, thank you again to Leslie Jones also for sharing all of her knowledge with us. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Leah, for your insightful message and how it highlights that today's session is a crucial component of the MAPC's ongoing efforts to broaden our approach to our work and to the approach um, that we are taking in the entire region. Um, so now let's move forward to our program and introduce our main speaker, Leslie Jonas. So Leslie Jonas is a native Cape Codder and Eel Clan member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. She is an experienced senior planning development strategist with a demonstrated history of working in tribal governments and nonprofits in senior level administration and planning. As a founding board member, Leslie has spent the past 12 years helping to build the first native led land Conser conservation trust east of the Mississippi, the Lata land Native Land Conservancy. And during the past few years, she has been researching and focusing on climate change from the indigenous perspective. Currently, this work has led her to co-teaching and co-advising environmental courses in social and environmental justice at UMass Boston and MIT, speaking publicly on climate change, rewilding, cultural respect, and environmental self-determination, while producing educational environmental video tools for audiences across many disciplines. In 2021, she was invited to sit on the Conservation Law Foundation Advisory Board for the state of Massachusetts, where she helps to advocate for human rights to land and clean water in Massachusetts. Leslie was recently chosen as a Keystone Co uh, Cooperator Fellow by UMass Amherst to join Women on the Land in the fall, where community um, opinion leaders come together for a three-day retreat, which focus on forest ecology and management, wildlife management, invasive plants and insects, and land protection. Les is a green native of Cape Cod whose interests have always been in the rescue, restoration, and preservation of our pre precious lands and water. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Leslie Jonas. We're eager to hear her perspective on today's topic. So Leslie, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so, Wani Kisak, Natasuis Leslie Jonas, Mutomas Masipia. Good day. My name is Leslie. I just ask for your patience. I'm recovering from a very bad flu, so I'm a little uh, I'm a little slower than usual, and I may mute to cough my brains out every now and again, but. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm Mashpi Wampanoag, Katapatanamu, Wachi Aki, Wachi Katahanash, Ka Awasak. I thank the universe for the land, the water, and for all creatures. For the past 12 years, as a founding board officer, I helped to build uh, the first uh, Indigenous Land Conservation Trust east of the Mississippi, um, the Native Land Conservancy that uh, Lindsay mentioned. Indigenous land conservation has become more and more popular over the past 25 years, but indigenous people have been land stewards and water warriors for thousands of years. And because of this, uh, we recognize the need for continued education of our work. The focus of our work is uh, indigenous land conservation and cultural respect. We do this by rescuing and preserving open spaces for everyone but specifically for the continuation of indigenous cultural life ways. We work in and with our tribal and land conservation communities much of the time, but now more and more, we're being asked um, and hired, or we're hiring and inviting others to work with us. Um, and that could be outside scientists, restoration and environmental ecologists, 
and others in uh, land conservation preservation projects. Uh, this is a shout out to Pete Westover, who I saw in the audience, um, a, a definite partner of the NLCs. Um, we, and we do this, we do this uh, because we acknowledge the power and shared value partnerships and relationships in our conservation practices. Here's a list of some of the groups that we do work with. Um, and most of these, I believe, are non-native. Um, and the important piece to this is that we share the same goals in conserving land and protecting and restoring its natural systems. And we recognize how critically important the, the value of these partnerships um, is. Partnerships that help to achieve, again, some of these common goals of conservation and preservation of the natural world. Our mission is to preserve and protect natural and cultural resources, the habitats, the ecosystems, and sites of cultural significance generally located in our Wampanoag homelands of Massachusetts, which is here in the map, all of um, Cape Cod and the islands, north to the Merrimack River, west to the Blackstone River, and down into eastern Rhode Island. Our approach to land management is rooted in traditional principles of sustainability while promoting a cross-cultural understanding. And I say this because we are one indigenous land conservation trust on Cape Cod amongst over 20 plus now probably 23 plus other non-native land trusts. And while we share core values in land and water conservation, we are definitely uniquely different. Our board of directors is made up of native people only from the tribes of Aquina, Herring Pond, Manamit, Mashpee, and the Nipmuc. And while our leadership is solely native led, our membership and committees are open to everyone. And it's important, and I want, I want to underscore this, uh, for the NLC to be Indigenous-led only, because it's really vital that we as Natives guide the process of our land conservation decision-making efforts, efforts that are typically rooted in our traditional land-based practices, practices that have taken place for thousands of years. So we draw upon our Native knowledge in terms of our experience in the woodlands and wetlands and our understanding of the natural world. In our environmental uh, management practices, we work with natural ecosystems for a holistic plan of sustainability and revitalization, always, always keeping the natural world at the forefront, but also understanding the grave losses that we've seen in these habitats. So we consistently seek to stabilize them. We work to protect, revitalize, and restore native plant species to reinvigorate the ecosystems that have kept the land and water in balance for millennia. For the NLC, we explore the land we rescue in efforts to recreate and protect the natural landscapes once rich in native vegetation, rich in food and wildlife, once rich in flora and fauna, and very rich in indigenous cultural prosperity. And we'd like to reintroduce these protected spaces for the perpetuation of our continued cultural living and sustenance. In 2013 and 2014, NLC founder Ramona Peters and I attended Land Trust Alliance conferences in Rhode Island and California. And we met Ohone Amamutsun tribal leader and president of the Amamutsun Land Trust, Valentin Lopez from Southern California, who so passionately spoke about cultural rights and respect to native peoples on their sacred homelands. He shared his cultural respect agreement with us. And we came home to work on our very own, given this was a hugely missing piece here on our homelands. So what is cultural respect? Well, the formal purposes of a cultural respect easement or agreement are the protection of indigenous people's access to land, often on land trust lands, respect for indigenous people's historical connection and contemporary relationship with these lands, and ensuring indigenous peoples feel welcome on their our ancestral lands, free from any possibility of harassment, discrimination, and arrest. This is about cultural respect. Entering into a cultural respect easement or agreement with the Native Land Conservancy 
makes the noble statement that you or your organization honor and respect the cultural continuation of, of indigenous people. And establishing one rekindles indigenous, indigenous connectedness to the ancestral homelands. A cultural respect easement gives access to natives to conduct ceremony, renew the oral tradition or stories formerly connected to that land, and in many cases, sustainably harvest medicinal plants, food, and other cultural elements. A cultural respect easement is, in fact, the closest expression of land rematriation to indigenous people without an actual transfer of deed because it provides assurance for us to safely access areas of our ancestral homelands to exercise our spiritual and cultural practices. Respect for our culture includes respect for our relationship with the earth, especially in areas where our ancestors foraged, where they prayed, sang, danced, lived, and where they were buried. And we still share this relationship with our Earth Mother today. We've been laser focused on cultural respect and the ways in which we can gain greater access to the natural world, land and water, without the threat of increased regulation and disrespect for Native people and our original rights to access. Another way the NLC has led to inspiring change is through policy influence in Massachusetts conservation restrictions. As of June 11th, 2021, the Commonwealth has included important new language in its criteria for protecting and using land through conservation restrictions, or CRs. This new language may be the first of its kind in the United States. And these inclusions provide a means for indigenous people to protect landscapes and features for their cultural significance, and also to gain access for special, specialized foraging and ceremony through partnership with landowners, municipalities, and other conservation groups. This is absolutely an important and historic statement of recognition and a new level of sensitivity to the intrinsic values of the indigenous people of Massachusetts. The continuation of post-colonial indigenous encroached territories is something indigenous people will deal with forever. However, land trusts and others will benefit from recognizing the inherent value of correcting these historic and present injustices and work with local tribes. The conservation movement will become stronger through serving a larger swath of people and incorporating indigenous knowledge. In fact, the conservation community, indigenous people, and the land will all benefit from this cooperation and trust, essentially cultural respect. Cultural respect easements or CREs are tailored to the partnership in place. Last December, the NLC recorded a CRE with the Dennis Conservation Land Trust here on the Cape. This CRE followed a five-year cultural respect agreement that was set to expire. The agreement was the first of its kind on the East Coast. With deepened understanding and partnership, the Dennis Conservation Land Trust expanded cultural access in perpetuity, that's forever and to the entirety of their 80 sites held in conservation. To us, the Dennis Conservation Land Trust making this move unprompted demonstrates a uniquely sincere partnership. And very importantly, this level of engagement and trust is an extraordinary initiative of authentic fellowship that will carry forward through generations to come. I've been following Indian law expert Rebecca Sosi, a Yaqui Indian law scholar who teaches and has written quite extensively on remedial or mitigation uh, plan concepts and what that means for Indigenous peoples. She talks a lot about um, adaptation strategies being potentially genocidal for many groups of Indigenous people and instead argues for recognition of indigenous right to environmental self-determination. Environmental self-determination basically means the right of indigenous people to remain on their homelands. And this would allow indigenous people to maintain our cultural and political status upon these traditional homelands. In the context of climate change policy, such a right would impose affirmative requirements on nation states to engage in mitigation strategies 
in order to avoid such climate related catastrophic harm to the indigenous people of these areas. So environmental self-determination for indigenous people is critical to the protection of our lives, our culture, and our future generations. And there's a lot that can and should be done in terms of mitigation and environmental justice. But in an intercultural or cross-cultural framework that recognizes rights to cultural survival. Very importantly, we have to be at the table for a lot of discussions, very important discussions. Next time I present in November, I'll be talking about climate change, but I wanted to just highlight that it does come into this presentation. However, I did not want to um, include so many different concepts that impact indigenous people um, into this one first presentation. So I'm just gonna mention that this next one on November 3rd will be highly important as it relates to climate change and the impacts to indigenous people. And I'll be sharing some of the effects up close and personally, boots on the ground and what's happening here on the Cape with climate related catastrophic conditions and between sea level rise and the, the water quality issues. It's um, no, it's, it's no lie that we are among some of the most vulnerable to losing our homes. So uh, it's gonna be an important conversation that we have in the next month and a half. Back to cultural survival. Cultural survival on our homelands brings up another very trending topic in the conservation movement and the conservation world, and that's rewilding. It's evidently clear that human impact to our natural world has harmed and polluted her to the point of devastation to all of the lands and waters of this country threatening our existences and all the existences of all the species. And I think beyond what we ever imagined. Climate change, destruction and pollution are at levels far higher and moving at rates far faster than scientists could have predicted even 50 years ago. And while the science was telling us that radical change had to happen, nothing happened for decades, leaving an environmental condition in ruin. It is in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy teachings that say we are a part of everything that is beneath us, above us, and around us. Our past is our present, our present is our future, and our future is seven generations, past and present. The Haudenosaunee are the people of the Longhouse. The Confederacy is made up of the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and the Senecas, and was intended as a way to unite the nations and create a peaceful means of decision-making. This teaching of we are part of everything has always resonated with indigenous cultures because it re represents the power of equality and balance, removing the threats of vertical power structures, ones that invite discord, animosity, and turmoil, and also reminding us of the value and the importance of lateral leadership models. As with the Haudenosaunee and many tribes across the country, we divide groups of related people or families into clans. Like the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we trace our clans through the, mat uh, the maternal line or the matrilineal. In our Wampanoag culture, our family clans are symbolized by the uh, animals you see here from the three earth elements of land, water, and air. Currently, we have eight clans. The bear, eagle, rabbit, otter, turtle, beaver, eel, and deer clans. I'm a member of the Wampanoag eel clan, so it came naturally to me to be committed to conserving and protecting water. It was Rachel Carson in Silent Spring who said, mankind has gone very far into an artificial world of his own creation. He has sought to insulate himself with steel and concrete from the realities of earth and water. And as he goes farther and farther into experiments for the destruction of himself and his world. In contemplating the exceeding beauty of the earth, there is symbolic as well as actual beauty in something 
as simple as the migration of birds in the ebb and flow of the tides, in the folded bud ready for spring. There's something infinitely healing in these repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. Carson's passionate concern in Silent Spring was with the future of the planet and all life on Earth. She calls for humans to act responsibly, carefully, and as stewards of the living Earth. Silent Spring inspired the modern environmental movement. However, the conservation movement from the early 20th century was different from the environmental movement of the late 20th century. It became more apparent after 1950. These movements were also different from the preservation movement. Conservation was more in line with the scientific planning of the use of natural resources, while preservation involved keeping us, keeping natural areas pristine and wild and lending itself to the more recent rewilding concept. Rewilding has been a topic of discussion in the conservation movement in the US for for some 40 odd years, and in Europe for far longer than that. However, the conservation, environmental, and preservation movements paved a way for what was considered a radical move to rewilding with early criticism, accusing it of dividing humans and non humans. And while this movement tries to align with many indigenous philosophies and practices, has been historically non-Indigenous and therefore blindly marginalizes Native people by its very nature as a movement about reconnecting to place, rooting oneself and returning to pre-industrial solutions, practitioners often unknowingly erase, ignore, and overlook important traditional knowledge and vital histories, thwarting real community and environmental healing. This approach of no human impact is based in a culture of white imperialism and privilege. And thus the reason why many indigenous groups and allies see it differently. We believe that the natural world needs human impact, healthy reciprocal exchange in all of our wellness. In popular culture, rewilding is meant to restore landscapes that were damaged by people ultimately removing human restoration interventions from the landscape once the land has recovered enough for nature to flourish on its own. What began in the US in the 1980s as an approach to ecological restoration called rewilding has been viewed by many indigenous environmentalists and experts as a form of environmental colonialism. And it is in this settler mindset where the confusion began. Yes. We found in the definition by leading Western scientists that rewilding concerned safeguarding, safeguarding and restoring native biodiversity through large scale interconnecting networks. These networks, they were reserves. They, they were established primarily to protect interacting keystone species and their trophic relationships that it fostered. And it did foster a disregard for indigenous culture and traditional ecological knowledge, a knowledge that's been based in ancient wisdom and passed down through generations of people living in relationship, in kinship to the land and water. It's a kind of human relation to the land and water that has always and will always be in balance and beneficial for all living creatures. Keystone species are species uh, which have extremely high impact on a particular ecosystem relative to its population. I think most of you or many of you know what keystone species are. These species are also critical for the overall structure and function of an ecosystem. Keystone is often a dominant predator whose removal allows prey population to explode and often decreases the overall diversity. So key, keystone species basically hold together the complex web of relationships in ecosystems. They can be animals, plants, or microorganisms. And good examples of keystone species are what you see here 
starfish, sea otters, wolves, and elephants. It's been cited that indigenous land management practices globally manage lands storing 17% of the world's forest carbon and harbor more biodiversity than the world's protected areas. Protecting indigenous peoples and local communities rights to their lands and forests has the potential to make a significant contribution to that solution. A report from the Rights and Resources Initiative, Woods Hole Research Center, WRI, and Environmental Defense Fund shows that indigenous peoples and local communities worldwide manage massive amounts of carbon in the trees and soil of their forests. At least 293,061 million metric tons. Scientists estimate that by managing the world's land more sustainably, such as by protecting forests and investing in reforestation, we could achieve up to 37% of emissions reductions necessary to limit the global rise in temperature two degrees Celsius by 2030. It was this man, it was Michael Soule, an American biologist who brought forward and developed an ecological restoration approach of, of rewilding in the, in the mid 1990s. He surmised that large carnivores need big, wild, roadless areas of habitat for security from humans and to fulfill their survival needs. Few protected areas in North America or anywhere in the world are large enough to stand alone as habitats. Therefore, core habitats need to be linked by wildlife movement corridors or landscape permeability. Thus, Soleil's concept of the three C's of rewilding were carnivores, cores, and connectivity. What was missing from this earlier rewilding theory concept was indigenous knowledge, an apparent widespread absence of any historic knowledge of traditional tenure on these lands. And the demise of native ecological systems, as Winona LeDuc, an environmental activist, so fervently describes in her book, All Our Relations, Native Struggles for Land and, and Life. More recent data cites that the reintroduction of native species to be left alone to heal and thrive without human in interaction comes with both benefits and risks. According to the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is the world's largest and most diverse environmental network, a misunderstanding of rewilding is that various applications of the rewilding concept have harmed communities and biodiversity and actually threatened to undermine the approach altogether. Now, this has become of great concern to Native communities as this notion of reversing biodiversity loss to create wild spaces and landscapes can appear dismissive and a form of continued erasure of indigenous cultures. Essentially, poorly or mismanaged rewilding carries risks for both biodiversity and local people. The idea of allowing nature to reclaim areas that are no longer under human management or impact has garnered quite a bit of attention in the conservation movement as an optimistic, proactive approach to conservation. Well-intentioned governments, NGOs, communities, and individuals are more frequently adopting rewilding strategy, uh, strategies. But if major concern is the basic principles, which are in many cases inconsistently defined and often misrepresented and misapplied. Another wilderness movement leader, Bob Marshall, feels that there's an unfortunate misunderstanding, which is that wilderness, the wilderness idea somehow erases indigenous people from the landscape. And instead, he states that the idea of wilderness was a, a reaction against the modern new order of environmental threat. It was certainly not at variance with the indigenous people or their sustainable life ways, which in fact, wilderness literature op often romanticized. So are these conflicting or intersecting perspectives and beliefs on the human nature relationship? When concepts and applications of rewilding are well informed and are mindful and include the local indigenous knowledge or native science, then we agree that rewilding can certainly be well applied, but what would this take? 
preserving and learning from traditional knowledge, culture, and language is a necessary and vital contribution to a restorative culture. We learn from traditional place-based knowledge everywhere, also in Western culture. Transformative innovation for a regenerative culture is also about asking ourselves, how do we re-indigenize and adapt to place while maintaining planetary awareness and global collaboration among all of humanity? I know these are big questions, but for many indigenous cultures to address the false separation between nature and culture requires us to acknowledge that learning from human ingenuity and long-term adaptations to particular environments is also learning from nature. Among indigenous peoples, there is a long tradition of solving human problems by learning from other species and from the wider natural processes of which we are all part. Essentially, rewilding can impact the ability to exercise cultural and traditional ecological knowledge in the natural world for indigenous people. However, in building climate resilience, sovereign tribal nations often work with a variety of partners in innovative ways to integrate tech, traditional ecological knowledge, or indigenous knowledge with advanced or modern technology tools and diverse res research methods to effectively address all of these issues, but in a culturally appropriate community context, an inclusive community context. This is critically important because indigenous people have typically been or stayed in our original place for thousands of years. We acknowledge and have always acknowledged our responsibilities to our earth mother so that nature and all of its species continue there exists a reciprocal relationship with the land as keepers of tradition as the original land stewards in dr robin wall kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass she states that indigenous or indigenous to place is a birthright and she asks the question if people do not feel indigenous can they nevertheless enter into the deep reciprocity that renews the world Essentially, rewilding can impact the ability to exercise cultural and traditional ecological knowledge in the natural world. And we acknowledge that our responsibility is about balance. And it should remain that way. And in our, in our partnerships with other conservation groups, local municipalities, private landowners and homeowners, we start to um, dig deeper into that that discussion and what that looks like and what that means and mostly there's been a shift in the thinking it's starting to happen and folks are starting to realize that indigenous knowledge is critical because of the way we lived and the way that we continue to live and on this note i'm going to roll a, a video that I produced uh, out of a video series called Connecting with the Natural Elements. And it's a four part mini documentary series on earth, water, air, and fire. I'm going to share water today so that you can see up close and personally what's happening uh, on Cape Cod in our waterways and how it's imp impacting all people and specifically the indigenous Mashpee Wampanoag of the area. Leslie, would you unmute so we can hear the audio? The ancestors taught us to respect the natural world, the earth and the water. Our original instruction was to live connected to the earth and water, to respect her, to honor her, to love her. Water is that which nourishes us. Water sustains all life.
Water is a precious element. It's the living thing itself. So joining with it, uh, the water we drink, much of it comes from the sky. Some of it comes from underneath the earth. But it's passed through so many other things that coming that we would actually drink it. And it gives us life forces from many different things. When it freezes, it has another effect on us. Uh, we live here where there's snowfall, sometimes lots of snowfall. We have to respect it in all of its forms. Water is, is strength. Without it, we can't survive. Water flows, so it teach, has teachings to us as well. Water is survival for us. The water means that uh, we come down to the water, we provide our food, uh, the natural food that we eat to keep us healthy. I feel the sustenance in it, but I also feel the energy of the water because water is a living entity. The spirits that are in the water, the, the water plants, the fish that are there, water is life to us. We can't live without the water. We can live without food, but we cannot live without water for any long first period of time. The water that flows through our bodies, water that flows through Mother Earth, the water that flows through Mother Earth is the veins of Mother Earth. So without that water, Mother Earth will not survive. One of the most special times in a woman's life when she births a child is she breaks water. We, uh, that is our first time uh, as human beings coming into this world, we're passing through water too. Water in our ceremonies um, and women carry our water. Um, and it's just uh, so important and vital to our life uh, as, as human beings on this earth. When I think about the power of water, the first thing that comes to mind is currents and waves, um, river, and how, how the fish and the herring uh, need to flow. When I go into the water, you know, it's like entering a whole other world. And that feeling inside of the water when you're just swimming through underneath the cold water, it's yeah, it's almost un indescribable with words, just how, how incredible it feels to hold your breath and, and be in that, in that space. The power of water, you, can, you hear it, you see it, you smell it, you taste it, embrace it. important things that I learned from my ancestors about water was it's our first medicine so um, it's what I go to anytime you know, I feel sick or hurt or uneasy. Respect it and and take what you need out of it don't ever overfish it because you know, when you overfish waters and taking out all all your stuff uh, and leaving not, nothing to see um, you only hurt yourself and your family because uh, there's nothing ever going to come back in those spots. It's not only life for our people, it's life for every human being on this earth is to keep this water clean. The elders say that many have lost their way. Many have forgotten the teachings of our ancestors, their wisdom as culture keepers. If humans continue on this path of destruction, there will be nothing left. For native peoples, this is dire as everything we do, every thought that we have, every energy we put forth considers the next seven generations. Cape Cod is sort of mostly a transient society where people are coming and going, mostly only in the summer. So they don't have a commitment to this land or the water. No relationship with it other than it's the backdrop to their movie. For indigenous people, we plan to be here. We've been here for over 12,000 years and we're 
intend to stay here. So some of us will be poisoned. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. We eat the shellfish, we eat the swimmers, the crawlers, crabs, anything that's, and that's, even things that grow from contaminated water. When I was a kid, you could just drink the water out of the lake. Now you can't go to these ponds and you can't even swim in them anymore because of the boats and the pollution. When you go into an area like this and, you know, years ago, 40 years ago, you would take 30 minutes to fill that basket. Now it takes me three hours, four hours to fill it. What it is like, because without the water, we won't, any of us will be here. We have green algae blooms that you know prevent us from swimming and prevent your daughters from being able to come in contact with the water. So, um, so yeah, like summertime and you know, when it's so hot out and the kids just want to be in the water swimming and they can't even jump in because um, it's toxic. Looking at the effects of climate change. What's going on on this entire planet and our part of it here in the United States? I feel like, well, it seems obvious that we're not going to give up any of our comforts or conveniences, even if it's going to save the planet. And so making those comforts and conveniences more healthy has to happen. As we know, uh, fish, shellfish in particular, is a filter, filter feeder. It cleans our waters. With the less fish we got in here, the less, the more pollution we're going to have. The bay's been dying for more than 50 years. The bait dies every time you put a coach down in there, it kills five feet or more, or even 12 feet around each coach. It kills the, the shellfish around it. Um, so years ago, there was hardly any docks here. There was fish here galore. Well, we have to go back to a sustainable type of living, more so than what we have been doing. We've been in the old world for so long that we, we have forgotten how to live in a sustainable life. When I go down and look at the heron that are running, look at some heron that are, there aren't as many as there used to be. It makes me feel sad. It makes me feel sick. I can feel its pain. Because, you know, in the natural spread, spring fed ponds that we have here in Massachusetts, in Cape Cod, and when those natural springs can't do what they're supposed to, they're cleansing. They bring up the water from our aquifer so that we can have fresh drinking water. It hurts the animals, it hurts the plant life that are there, what was naturally put there, and the inalienable rights we can't use. I know a lot of people uh, just don't believe in uh, the old ways. Um, but even we had many forms of purification uh, in our culture. We use different substances and people are looking at, you know, sage and using it a lot and sweet grass, to clean the air, bad energies, things like that. Chants, songs, uh, songs to the water, to the water bodies. But we have generations to come that we have to try to clean this up for them. So they have something at least to live on. So they can enjoy these woods and see these waters come back clean again. So that's our responsibility to take care of that. In the future, I predict that we'll start to realize and wake up and understand that we can't keep doing things the same way over and over again and that we'll start to correct some of these issues that are causing problems and start to find new ways to doing things that allow us to keep the waters clean.
Um, right now, there's a few of us, older gentlemen and a few uh, people in our tribe are uh, going back to uh, find the springs that we had in the river and bring it back to life. So we get that fresh, clean water. I find it hard to talk about because it's, it's really very painful how certain levels of ignorance can ruin the life for so many living things and for others, other people who are now and into the future will not be able to, to drink it, uh, swim in it, protect it, nurture it, love it as it has you. Water sustains us. We are made of water. It's part of our DNA. Without water, clean water, all life will end. Water is sacred. Stop trying to move. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was an amazing talk and a, a wonderful, wonderful video. And you said this is part of a broader series that you are producing the videos. Um, just a quick question. When are these are these videos going to be available for the public to see? Is they're going to be uh, uploaded to a website when you're completed with all of them? Or um, how are you going to be sharing these with everyone? So that was one of the four part series. I'm now, uh, I just, I'm wrapping up air and fire will be produced and shot um, next, probably in the, in the next nine months. Um, they will be on our website. We're reconstructing our website. The Native Land Conservancy website? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh. then, um, and I present them a lot in my, uh, my presentations to higher ed institutions and the state and to other folks so oh perfect um okay so now we're going to get into our q a session um so if you have any questions you can drop them into the uh q a and again we won't i'm sure not get to all of the questions that you guys have now or submitted through the registration um but we can answer a few of them so one of the uh, first questions that we have, Leslie, is how can people build perception or focus to seeing or experiencing the patterns of the past? A big loaded question there, but um, my first reaction, given what's happen happening um, in our government, is um, to not dismiss or misrepresent and not to deny what we know history to be, and then, um, and not to minimize it. Um, and at the same time, I think um, a really important factor is, is education and um, celebrating indigenous brilliance as well, and not just the, um, the egregious history. Um, because there's a lot going on in, in Indian country and great things are happening. There's a lot that still needs to happen, but I would say stay informed and educate yourself, especially if you feel a tendency to want to dismiss or minimize something that, um, and most people aren't even really aware of some of the historic patterns that took place, not only in land management, but you know, um, things like the Indian Removal Act and forced migration, forced assimilation through boarding schools and the abuses there. There's, there's a lot, it's, it's a lot to unpack. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, another one we have is conservation organizations tend to value degrees and mainstream science. So how do we shift their views to value indigenous knowledge? So firstly, right out of the gate last December, um, was yeah, December of 2022, in a memo to all federal departments and agencies, President Biden committed to strengthening relationships between the federal government and Indian tribes. And uh, underscoring this, a commitment to scientific integrity. 
by the inclusion inclusion um, of indigenous knowledge in the research that's being done um, that Biden called an important body of knowledge and it contributes to scientific, technical and social economic economic advancements of, of our uh, of the United States into our collective um, understanding of the natural world and how we work together. So right there in a nutshell, it says uh, it says really everything that we should know is that it just it should be taking place. Uh, we should be and folks should be reaching out to the local indigenous tribes of the land that they're on. If they're organized tribes, it's going to be easier. And what I mean by that is ones that hold tribal governments, um, tribal councils that uh, sort of help to manage the business of the tribe. Um, unfortunately, becoming federally recognized helps with that. But that, again, is a very Western system imposed on tribes to legitimize us and um, kind of hold us accountable. Um, so and that's a whole other topic, but um, I'd say that the relationship building piece of that is hugely important. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have another question and that would be, um, what approaches invite pathways leading toward reciprocal relationships with tribal nations and peoples? So these, these all have very similar um, answers in the relationship building component. And that's what a lot of these questions tend to kind of come from that angle is how do we connect with you? And basically it's, it's, it's tricked and, and I can speak for a lot of non-native people probably in the audience that have tried to reach out to tribal people and it can be really hard and here's why. Not only are we being pulled on a lot these days because of the trendiness of incorporating indigenous knowledge and those of us who work very closely with land and or water um, and involved in traditional land management practices. But um, there, there, there's a perception that, um, that it's a given that, that we're gonna uh, release our our native science, our traditional ecological knowledge. And a misunderstanding around tech is that tech is universal. It's not, it's place-based, it is regional, it is community-based and it evolves. Ours has changed because the world changes, the world evolves, the land, the water evolves. Unfortunately, um, not in a good way, in the last 50 years. And so our traditional ecological knowledge has shifted to incorporate how we rebalance, how we bring balance back. And those are a lot of those systems are, are basically about management of invasive species, not only species that were brought here by, you know, from trips abroad and, and plants and things brought back, but birds migrating can also bring seeds and drop seeds and things can travel that way as well. The wind in the air can, can make things travel. But invasive species management is a huge issue in land management right now. And reinvigorating these natural ecosystems by bringing back a lot of the nat native species that have been lost. Biodiversity loss is huge. Um, reaching out and getting to know somebody in a tribe making a connection and building um, a relationship through trust and honesty and good healthy communication is a way to work with indigenous people on incorporating traditional ecological knowledge. Just to come at it with, you know, we expect this to happen kind of approach never works because um, you have to look at the history of the relationships. So there's, there's a trust that needs to, um, in, a, in a relationship building exercise that needs to happen. Excellent. Um, another one that is sort of similar, as you said, a lot of these, there are similar themes. Um, how do you see indigenous land management practices being incorporated into ecological restoration actions? Yeah, these are all starting to kind of blend, yeah. So relationship building to um, find out who your local tribal, um, you know, people are who work in the fields of natural resources, tribal historic preservation. So a TIPO, 
So we have a TIPO, a Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. So reaching out and making connections um, is, is, is the way to do it. It's building bridges and breaking down old biases and, and fears that are, that are still there. We, we find them, we bump into them. And that, that's, that's the only way it's gonna work is to build these relationships to be able to bring the two sciences together to actually create real life, tangible solutions. Um, I guess a follow up to that that we also got was how should land trusts or other organizations or municipalities uh, create trust and accountability with indigenous communities? Well, um, I, we have a fair amount of experience with that, the Native Land Conservancy, and some went well and some did not go so well because of a lack of trust. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's old, really old, deep rooted biases that people carry. And um, one of the examples of a breakdown in those old systems that are that are harmful and painful to, to, to modern and current relationship building. Uh, we, we witnessed in my presentation with the Dennis Conservation Land Trust opening up access to all of their 80 sites in perpetuity for indigenous people of these lands. And in the past, it was to only these sites and you could only go on this land for five, you know, for five years and then we'll check again in five years what this looks like. So. Our question back to these folks was, do you see putting a time limit on our culture? Five year time limit. So I think that was an eye opening moment. And I think that expression of fellowship really resonates. And I think other people want to do the same thing. I think people do want to do the right thing. And um, through that, there's a lot of education that needs to happen. In, I think, it, I think it's possible. I think it's gonna take a long time, but I think it's very possible. Another question is, or and I think this will be our last one because um, we're running the clock here, is how do current land conservation methods such as conservation restrictions, state agency ownership, hurt or help indigenous lifeways? Um, typically have hurt them in the past or at least restricted them. Any so like our cultural respect easement is a way to break that down and open that up a little bit for indigenous access. When you tell native people on their homelands, homelands upon which we've lived and our ancestors for 12,000 years, that we can't go to a specific place to say practice a ceremony or something in the woods, that's pretty hurtful. So the restrictions in typical CRs, conservation restrictions, I get what they're for, they protect land uh, from certain act activity. Um, that's why our cultural respect e easement is sort of a CR, but in a softened, more humane kind of approach to instead of restriction, it's more about opening up what one can do and not about what one cannot do. So I think it's changing the, the, the kind of um, approach to that, to that dialogue, to that conversation. And, you know, working more from this lateral Haudenosaunee, you know, we're all one, we're all, we're all here together, you know, and we should all be able to access freely. Excellent, thank you. So we're gonna end our Q&A there. I know there were more questions that we just didn't have time to get to, but thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions and reflections that you've shared. Um, and so as we approach the final stage of um, our virtual program today, I, I find it important to pause and express our sincere appreciation to Leslie, whose valuable insights will undoubtedly shape all of our approach to our future work. Um, and so I just wanna move also now onto some important announcements. So firstly, we encourage you to stay engaged with our upcoming session. So save the date on your calendar that we'll be back on Thursday, October 12th at 12 p.m. And this session will be, feature Linda Coombs and Brett Stearns. Linda is an Aquina Wampanoag and Brett is the director for the Natural Resource Department for the Aquina Tribe. And they will be talking about the Wampanoag 
perspective on traditional ecological knowledge, its evolution and resilience through colonization, and its vital role in modern climate resiliency efforts, highlighting efforts that the Natural Resource Department is currently engaged in, such as herring and marsh grass restoration. This is also going to be joint with our Accelerating Climate Resiliency series, also put out through MAPC. Um, and so our third session will be followed by our last two sessions, which will be on Thursday, October 26th at 12 p.m. and Friday, November 3rd at 12 p.m., which Leslie will be back for our uh, fifth and final one. And we're committed to providing you with valuable content, so we hope to see you at all of these. Um, and additionally, we invite you to visit our landing page regularly. This is where we'll be uploading all the presentations um, and any other information that we need to share about the series. And lastly, a sincere thank you to all of you who uh, came in and joined us here live today and all those who may be listening to the recording later on. So um, thank you for being part of this valuable virtual program and we truly appreciate your support. So. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely Friday and a wonderful weekend.